بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد My brothers and sisters, I welcome you all here today and I greet to you from my heart to all of you Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh First of all, you know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to apologize. Because normally I am never late for any of my engagements. And uh, unfortunately today I am late. And I have no excuse but to say uh, to ask you to forgive me inshallah. I will try to make the most of our time today inshallah ta'ala. As you all know the topic for my discussion with all of you is titled pretty much building an Islamic home and raising children according to Islamic morals and ethics. Now, when I was thinking of a topic like this, the idea that came to mind was, let's just list a couple of things or a bunch of things. Let's just list a bunch of things that people should do and this is how you build an Islamic home. You need to do step one, step two, step three, and it can come from any direction. We can come from an Islamic or spiritual direction, practically, socially, whatever level that we're at. Just try to pick out pieces here and there and put them together. But I thought to myself that it's been done. And you know, I said to myself, Muslim, it's been done already, so what are you going to do? And I thought to myself, is there a surah in the Quran? that personally I'm comfortable with, that I can use and extract lessons or morals from that particular surah and implement it in my life with our children. And use those lessons to raise our children and create a healthy Islamic environment. <coughs> I found many, many surahs like this. And I even found almost every single surah of the Qur'an hints towards this. But there was one particular surah that stood out out of all of the surahs of the Qur'an. And it is none other than a surah that I'm sure all of you have heard before, especially the story in this particular surah. And it is none other than the surah or the chapter of Yusuf alayhi salam. Surah Yusuf, I mean we can't talk about the story itself, but I'll just give you a brief insight so we're all on the same page. Surah Yusuf is of course regarding that son who had many brothers, including himself, there were 12 of them, but he had 11 of them, where they plotted against him, eventually throwing him into a well. A caravan came, he went to Egypt, and eventually he went from being this poor individual to one of the richest people in Egypt. So he went from one extreme to the other extreme, but a series of events happened in between. Allah Azza wa Jal calls this story Ahsan al-Qasas. It is the best and story that you can ever find in the Quran. According to some scholars of Islam, it's the best story, period. It's the best of all stories, period. So I thought to myself, why not extract some pearls of wisdom from this particular story and show you, inshallah, how you can use these points to implement not only with yourself as a mother and father, but also use it for your sons and daughters. So let's begin. First point that I want to raise your attention to is the way that Surah Yusuf begins. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Alif Lam Ra, Tilka Ayatul Kitab Al Mubin. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says something very, very unusual. After the third verse, Inna Anzalna the Quran in Arabic, Al Alaq Taqdim. The fourth verse, Allah says, Nahnu Nakusu Alaika Ahsan Al Qasas. We are going to relate to you the best of stories. So you know what's happening? Allah is our storyteller right now. He's going to tell us a story. 
And the fact that he's going to tell us a story, it tells you and I that as human beings, we love stories. Stories is a part of how we grow up, especially for children. That's why the word story in the Arabic language, in the, in the surah, it's in the plural form. But originally this word is qissatun. Qissatun means the footsteps that you find in the sand. And a person who walks in those footsteps. I mean, for us here, we don't have you know much sand in this in, in this part of the world. So just imagine yourself that when you're walking outside on a snowy day and you see those footsteps on the ground and you walk into those footsteps. That's called qissa. That's actually how story is defined in the dictionary. What does that have to do with telling a story? Just imagine a kid. When you're telling them a story, they feel as though they're part of it. They feel as though they're walking through each and every step in that story. So what Allah is saying is, I'm going to tell you a story, and that story is going to make you feel as though you are part of it. So if you're telling your children a story about a dragon, what is the child going to think he's a, he or she is? They're going to think that I'm the dragon. If you're going to tell that child a story about, you know, the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, who do you think that child is going to pretend that they, they are? They're going to think that they're Yusuf alayhi salam, going through all the well, this and that. Now, why is this important when raising a family? Because what this tells you is that creating a nurturing and comfortable environment that doesn't always have to be spiritually influenced. In other words, you're not always going to be focused on just religion, religion, religion all the time. What this tells you is that it's okay to do other things that may not have any relationship with the religion as long as you follow limits, as long as you follow conditions. Can you imagine, we're encouraged to have fun. Let me give you an example. You know, once there was a time when the Prophet, peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was riding a horse and his wife was riding a horse on her own. And they were beside each other. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, says to his wife, okay, you stop. And tells the rest of his friends, keep going forward and leave us alone. So once all the companions and his friends went ahead, he tells his wife, okay, you come off your horse and I'll come off my horse. They stand beside each other. Imagine, this is happening in the middle of the desert. And he looks at his wife and he says, are you ready? So she says, okay. And he says, well, he doesn't say, I mean, Marks gets set, go, but it's, it's kind of that image. And he basically is telling her, are you ready? I want to have a race with you. And just like that, for no reason, he starts to raise his wife in the middle of the desert. Now the first time that this happened, his wife beats him. You know, she wins the race. So the Prophet beats me and I was like, okay, fine. A few months go by, three, four months. Eventually his wife, you know, she, she gains some weight and things like that. So guess what the Prophet peace be upon him does next time? They're in the desert. She's on a horse, he's on a horse. Companions are there, so he takes advantage of the moment. He tells the companions, go ahead, leave us alone. Oh Aisha, come off your horse and I'll come off my horse. He tells her, ready, set, go. So he races her now when she slowed down and she's gained some weight, so guess who wins this time? It's the Prophet, peace be upon him. And then he looks at his wife and he says, look, I had to get you back. <laughs> right? And that's it. And it just, the story ends this way. There are so many other instances where the Prophet ﷺ has this kind of sense of humor with his family, with the people that are closest to him. I'll give you another example. You know, once there was a time when Ali Ali was a strong and powerful warrior. He was a brave individual. So one day Ali is sitting with a bunch of his companions and he's saying to all of them, nobody, no one here can really take me down. None of you guys can really pin me to the ground. So everybody's like, yeah, that's right. You're too brave, you're too big and strong. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, asks Ali, did everybody have a chance 
to pin you down. So Ali says, yeah, yeah, everybody did. So the Prophet peace be upon him says, no, there's one person that you didn't challenge. So Ali looks at him and is like, who is this person? So the Prophet says to him, come back tomorrow by that tree after Dhuha, the hottest time of the day. So Ali is like, okay, fine. He says, come back there, you'll meet the person and then you can challenge him. So the next day, on the hottest time, in, you know, in the afternoon, Ali is standing underneath this tree and he's waiting for this person. So a man comes by and he has his face wrapped up, all you can see is his eyes. So the man says to Ali, Al-Ula, round one. So they go at each other. So they're pushing and shoving, and this man pins him to the ground. So Ali looks up and he's like, okay, let's do this again. So the man says, Athan, round two. So they go at it again, and this man pins him down. So Ali looks up and he says, last chance, okay? Let's go for a third time. So the man says, Athan, round three. So they go at it, go at it, go at it, and he pins him down. So Ali looks up at the man and says, who are you? Where'd you come from? And this person unraveled that cover around his face. Guess who it is? It's the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It shows you that he had this personality about him. He knew when to be serious, but he also knew when to be easygoing and relaxed. And he knew who to do it with. And he knew at what level it should go and when it should stop. For one person, he might be a little more playful than someone else. So he knew when he understood each individual. You have to do this with children. Because you know, in our society today, children have really really weird and strange personalities. You'll find that one of your child may grow up really serious and want to do everything about the deen and love Islam and memorize the Quran, but you don't have any consistency with the other children. You'll have another child that's on a different you know, world altogether. Doesn't want to read anything. You're always going to have to be pestering him to do this and to do that. So you have to use this kind of hikmah or wisdom of knowing how to be the storyteller of your children. <coughs> Lesson number two. Lesson number two. You remember when the Prophet Yusuf saw the dream? He saw the stars and the sun and the moon. All of these things, they were prostrating to him. So he goes up to his father and he says, Oh father, I saw this happening. What does the father say to him? La Don't tell anybody about this dream. Why did the father do this? Now imagine, his father is a prophet of Allah. The father could have said, well, why did you see that dream? I'm the prophet of Allah. I'm the one who should have seen that dream. Because the father already knew what that dream meant. He understood this concept. So he knew that what this meant was that all of them eventually will be prostrated to Yusuf But the father doesn't do that. You know what the father says? He says to the son, don't tell your brothers about this dream. They're going to plot against you. Why? The father wants to protect his child. And that's the second wisdom that we get from the surah. Us mothers and fathers, we are protectors of our children. And our primary focus is that we protect our children, we protect their identity. We protect their Muslim identity and we make them feel that there should, they, they should be proud of who they are. Let me give you an example of what's happening today. Today, now, you know what children find lust and power and control? They find themselves becoming more superior to others. And you know how they find it? Imagine a kid has an iPhone 4 and the iPhone 5 just came out, right? So the kid walks into the Apple store and he trades up for the iPhone 5. And he walks out the Apple store and he's holding the iPhone 5. I, I can feel the power, you know. I 
Alhamdulillah, الذي أحيانا بعد ما أماتنا. You know, it's like he's just gonna say, you know, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me life now after I was dead with the iPhone 4. I feel the power now with the iPhone 5. You know, I got it. So you see that that's what children find their their power, their superiority is how much they can consume. Let me do an experiment here, really quickly. How many of you have children that is around the ages of like 8 to 10 and older? How many have children around 8, 10 or older? Quite a few of you, as a matter of fact, the majority of the parents do. What's the first thing that your child asks you for at 8 years old? Or 10 years old? Just shout it out to me. What's the first thing they ask for? An iPod. An iPod. What the brothers, what did they ask for? An iPad, the Wii, a, what is that? An Xbox, a PS3. You see, you see, do you see the experiment? Do you see what children were focused on? They just wanted gadgets and things that were better than what other people around them had. This is the focus, this is what they grew up finding, that this is what would make me a better person. How many people today that you know of, where their child at 8 or 10 years old will say, I want my first pocket Quran. I want to go to that conference I've been hearing or hearing about. You're, old. You're a teacher. I want to come to your class one time. Just one time and see. You know what my passion was with my father growing up? With my father, my passion was, he was a truck driver. I just had to be with my father in his truck. I felt like I was driving that truck at 8 years old. Just because I was sitting beside him, I remember sitting and I would watch him change the gears and what do you think I'm doing? I'm changing my own gears. My father is holding that big steering wheel, what do you think I'm doing? I'm holding the dinner bowl and I'm steering and driving with my dad like this. And today, at my age and at my time and as a father myself, those are the moments that I remember with my father. So what legacy do you want to leave behind for your children? Do you want your children to remember you as the person where dad was always on his phone, mom always spoiled me, spoiled me and gave me everything that I wanted? Or do you want to leave the legacy behind that? My father was a hard-working man. And I want to be a hard-working person like Dad. My mom, no matter what her hijab was on, she was reading Quran, she was teaching me, she was making sure. She was my first public school. My mom was the first middle school. My mom was my first high school. My mom was my first college and university. That's the kind of mom I want to be. So you decide what kind of legacy you want. So that's the second point. You want to protect that Muslim identity and make your children feel proud of who they are. Our children today, they don't feel proud of being Muslim anymore. You ever find that some children will be walking out on the street with their friends or something and they'll see like a guy with a huge tattoo on his face, earrings, a woman that's like, you know, no hijab or anything like that and they'll say, if I wasn't Muslim, I'd dress just like that guy. Or I do the same thing that they're doing. Or man damn, you know, you guys are going to the club, but I'm Muslim and that's haram, so I can't go. It's almost as if they're giving themselves the guilt trip. Like, I wish I could, but Islam stopped me. Now I can't have fun. The first fun fundamental rule about Islam, it never came to destroy fun. It came to protect your enjoyment. It came to set limits. Because you know, how, you know how we grow up hearing too much play, it just causes you to become corrupt and you don't take anything seriously in life. That's why the religion is there. Islam is not to make your life miserable, but it's to actually control all the good times that you have in your life. Number three, third point. The third point is very, very important. Allah Azza wa Jal continues and says, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبِ كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا عَلَىٰ أَبَوَيْكَ مِنْ قَبْلُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَابِ Pause there. What is Allah Azza wa Jal doing? 
Allah Azza wa Jal is telling the Prophet Ya'qub alayhi salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Yusuf alayhi salam, this dream that you just got, don't worry. I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to protect you. Here's the point of evidence, guys. So pay attention to this. I'm going to protect you the same way that I protected your father, Ya'qub. That's Yusuf's father. Who is Ya'qub's father? Ishaq. Who is Ishaq's father? Ibrahim. So Ibrahim is who to the Prophet Yusuf? It's his great grandfather. And Ishaq is his grandfather, and obviously Ya'qub is his father. So what's the pattern here? Allah is saying, as long as you come from a good home, with good parents, with a good lineage, with righteous people, then you're also going to be the same. If you create a good and religious home, a good and healthy environment for your children, that's the kind of offspring that you're going to leave behind. Let me give you an example. Here's one of the most classic habits that a lot of Muslim communities have. And that is, whenever you bring your children to those classes on Sundays or Friday nights, what do a lot of parents do? They drop them off. But that's okay. But the problem is, is what do the parents go and do while their children is memorizing the Quran and listening to this shaykh and that shaykh, the parents is scarfing down a couple uh, cups of tinnies until their children are finished. So they're just relaxing and chillaxing until the child is When the child is done, this is where all the problems begin. Because the child will look at the mom or the dad and say, you know mom, dad, I just learned that it is actually the practice of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that we don't raise our hands whilst the khatib on the day of Jumu'ah is making du'a. I just learned that that was a sunnah, and we used to do it all the time. Here's where the, here's where the separation, the barrier starts now. The parents will look at him and oh, don't listen to them, they don't know anything. Oh, don't listen to them. Look, we were doing it for like 45 years, so don't listen to what that shit says. So this is where you start going on the right side and your children start going on the left side. Just this morning, I looked at my email account and I got an email from a sister in Bangladesh. And this sister sent me a long email and I went through it. And the first thing in the subject line of the email, she says, I don't want to be here anymore. That's the subject of her email. I don't want to be here anymore. So I took it very seriously. So when I went through it, this is her exact crisis that she's dealing with in her home. That in, in her home, her parents are on one page, but she is on a completely different page. She's trying to learn and educate herself. As a matter of fact, I think it mentioned there that she was going to get her PhD. But her mom and dad don't know how to recite Surah Fatiha properly. And as a matter of fact, she mentions that her parents don't even pray. But her now, she's waking up in the middle of the night and she's praying, she's doing all of those things. This is where the problem is. And this is why scholars, they say that we must, even it's an Islamic moral, it's an Islamic ethic that we have, that we must lead by example. You want your children to be good, be good to yourself. You want your child to wear hijab, wear the hijab yourself. If you want your child to be in a class, make sure you're in a class yourself as well. If you want your child to go to the conference, make sure you're sitting right beside your child at that same conference. And when your child learns something about the deen, come to them with an open mind and listen to what your child says and be a student to your child. Remember that the religion of Islam has no age limit. You can be a young scholar, you can be an old scholar, you can be a teacher. The Prophet, peace be upon him, once said, this religion is built upon advice, but doesn't specify at what, which category or which you know, age limit, none of that. Just says that this is an advice, so share that advice with each other. My first Quran teacher in Saudi was an eight-year-old boy. I was embarrassed at first 
Because I didn't know any, but I didn't know I was judgmental. I was like, Here, here's an eight-year-old kid that's going to teach me Quran. And, I, and as I continued, and I started learning, and I started humbling myself more and more, that child ended up being the best teacher that I've ever had in my life. That child. Eight years old, I was like 21. And you know, it was so cute. The child's like, okay, you ready? Please. You know, I think it's sick. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna read now. So I'm like, a'udhu billahi min He's like, no. <laughs> right? And he stops me right there, this is wrong. You know, as a matter of fact, some of you guys might see him. He's become world famous, alhamdulillah. He's a child originally from Afghanistan, but he was born and raised in Medina. And his YouTube video is on YouTube as well. I don't want to know what it's under. I mean, if you type his name, his name was Abdul Rahman. If you type his name, it doesn't come up. But what I did was I, I wrote down Quran competition in Medina. And I couldn't believe it. I saw this beautiful young child, and it was him. He was wearing a white scarf, and he was reciting uh, portions from Surah Al-Anbiya. وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّ So he's reciting all of these things, and I just couldn't believe this kid was my teacher. So that's why, that's why you gotta love when your children are hungry and thirsty. But you as parents, don't lose your appetite. Always make sure you have a little bit of that appetite inside of you as well. Number four, the fourth lesson. Now this is the nitty gritty of Surah Yusuf. The nitty gritty of Surah Yusuf is the, the plot begins where the brothers, they say amongst each other, our father, he only likes Yusuf. So let's just get rid of Yusuf. Let's go throw him out. Let's go, you know, you know, end his life. Let's go throw him into a well, whatever. Let's just get rid of him. And come back to the father like saints, you know. We're just going to come back like pious, calm individuals. The fourth lesson here is, this entire plot starts off because of jealousy. Jealousy causes an individual to do crazy things. Because jealousy is actually a very filthy problem that starts within the heart. It shows discontentment in a person and especially with what Allah has given that individual. That's why the Prophet, peace be upon him, once said that on the day of judgment, jealousy is going to shave off our good deeds. Jealousy will shave off the good deeds of an individual on the day of judgment. So eventually, slowly, all of that nubur and that light of righteousness that you have in you is going to is going to eventually extinguish. Now, how do you relate this all to raising a good home and a good family? The way that you, you relate to all of this is simply by treating all of your children and everybody in that household to some equal some level of equality. To at least have some reasonable understanding that everybody will have a strength and everybody will have a weakness and allow those strengths and weaknesses to either help each other or complement each other. This takes skill, brothers and sisters. I know it might sound like something like simple or common sense. This takes a lot of skill. You have to mentally train yourself how to do this. Because you know one of the complaints that I get like every single day, all the time, constantly it keeps coming in front of me. I have five children, but one of them is a bad one. Can you fix it? You know, they bring it in front of my office and be like, okay, do something to it. What the whole problem that I have with this scenario is how the problem is presented. You basically single out this one child from everyone else. What you should say is I have five children. And all of them have great qualities about them, but this one just needs some assistance in this part of his life. What I want to hear in the very beginning is something positive about your child, because what that tells me is that's what your focus is all about. Your focus on making children and your home a better place. And you're trying your best to clean up all those surrounding elements that might cause otherwise. Number five. And inshallah, I'll just, you know, do a few more inshallah and then we will conclude. Number five. 
Number five, you guys remember in the story where Yusuf السلام, eventually goes to uh, he goes to Egypt and then he becomes a servant to the wife of the Aziz in that palace and then she tries to seduce him. She tries to throw herself at him. She locks all the doors in the palace and then she tries to throw herself at him. One of the companions, Ibn Abbas, he says that the way that she presented herself was she put on the most beautiful makeup and perfume and that's how she lured him in. What this means is that she was studying him for a long time. She was studying him for a long time. She was planning this for a very long time. Now just imagine, just look at the image what's happening here. You have this elite young woman Beautiful. She has status and authority. Then you have a servant who is considered, unfortunately at that time, was considered to be subhuman. And here he is, he's being seduced by this, you know, elite young woman who's rich and famous. So what does she do? She throws herself at him. Listen to the response of Yusuf He says, قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ Allah says, look at the response. The first thing that Yusuf says is, I seek protection from Allah from you. What does this teach you? Nobody can ever overcome a sin unless you ask Allah to help you. Nobody can ever overcome a mistake unless you have Allah's help beside you. Nobody can say that well, because of my efforts, because of Quran, because I've graduated, because I've done this and I've done that, you know, inshallah things are going to be easy. We all know stories like this. Of the greatest individuals to walk the face of this earth. The most pious individuals to walk the face of this earth. Yet still they end up falling into some of the gravest mistakes. So Yusuf said he calls upon Allah. This is a lesson for any home. Every single home should have halaqa time. Every single home should have time where you sit down as a family and you talk about something to do with Islam. So tonight, what you may want to do is you may want to go home with your family and your children and you may want to sit down and tell them, I don't know, five points that you heard from Surah Yusuf at a conference or something today, right? So you want to pull out something and you want it to present it and talk about it. What did you get out of all of this? Why are you sitting here in this auditorium? And what is it doing for you when you're hearing all of these words in the same Quran that we all love and we believe in? How is it going to affect you? That's what you want to sit down and you want to share with your family. And, and in, in, uh, in addition to that, the best stories, stories of the Quran, period. Don't start to get into all this bumble jumbo stuff that you'll find on TV here and there. Just stick to the fundamentals. You know, I know of a brother who sat down and he started to teach his son Surah Yusuf. And every single day he was feeding him Surah Yusuf bit by bit. It was like a piece of chocolate. He's like, okay, look, I'll give you a piece today, but you can't have the full bar until we continue. Next day I'll give you another piece. Next day I'll give you another piece. Before you know it, this young child starts off just hearing the story from his father and ends up memorizing the whole surah. Ends up memorizing the entire surah. Why? Because his father made him fall in love with it. So he stops out, he, he finds his like climax moment in the story and he's like, to be continued. And <laughs> he stops right there. So he'll, you know, when they're just about to throw him in the well, he, he, he explained this to me. He's like, when I got to the part where he was thrown into the well, I, I, I tried to act it out in front of my son. So I pretended I was falling into a well. And the son was like, oh my God, oh my God, Dad, what's happening to you? And that's when he stopped. He said, I'll tell you what happens to him tomorrow. And he found that his son during the night was begging him, Dad, tell me what happened to Yusuf, what happened to Yusuf? That's what you want to do with your children. You know the worst storyteller is? 
Sarah. Once upon a time, there was a prophet named Yusuf. Say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, you know you're, just, you're gonna have with them for every little thing. <coughs> this is the worst storyteller. Remember, brothers and sisters, the way I started off this discussion, a story should make the person who is listening to it feel like they're a part of it. If you can accomplish that with any story of the Qur'an, Wallahi, you're going to be a very, very intelligent and effective individual every single time you open your mouth. Every single time you speak it, you're going to be able to do this. It's not enough, and, and I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking for me to say that it's not enough to just say Allah says or the Prophet peace be upon him said. Sometimes you're going to have to add these little uh, excerpts, you know, these little stories and things like this, just to kind of beautify the package for your children. So Yusuf alayhi salam, he asks Allah, oh Allah, protect me. Children, this year is for you. I know exactly what it feels like when you walk into this environment. I know exactly what it feels like when you walk out of your home and you got friends that are doing the complete opposite with you. I know exactly what it feels like that you might be surrounded with a hundred and one different things that are all haram and you know that if your mom and dad saw you, you'd get in trouble for it. What is my advice to you? Always ask Allah to protect you. Do what Surah Yusuf taught us to do. He was in this moment where this beautiful woman is right in front of him. And she says to him, Haytalak. The Arabs, you guys know exactly what Haytalak means. Hayta is a word that you can't tell anybody. You can't use this word for anyone. Because it's a very explicit word. It's a very, uh, it has sort of like an erotic meaning to it. You know, she's basically, basically saying, do anything you want to me right now at this moment. Immediately, Allah is the one that protects him. Why? Because he calls upon Allah to do this. So that's what you want to always make sure that happens every time you're under these pressures. I totally understand. Yes, mom and dad, maybe 30 years ago, they were walking probably seven, eight miles to school. I totally get that. Today, we wouldn't even walk to our neighbor's house. I know, I understand that. But this does not excuse you from dealing with the same pressures that mom and dad dealt with in their past. We're always going to be faced with these ugly doors in front of us. Ask Allah to help you. And finally, brothers and sisters, I want to just mention one side point. Because one of the specialties that I have, that I've taught you know, the, you know, many times over my dowry, my dowry years, is that I focused a lot about um, aggression, depression, anxiety, uh, bipolar, all of these different issues that a lot of the youth and even some adults are dealing with today. What I will say to you, mothers and fathers, if you have a child that every day when they come home, they lock themselves into a room, or you don't seem to have a, a decent, quote-unquote, normal level of communication with your children, if you don't know what they're doing each and every day, and, and by this I don't mean you gotta know their secrets, no. You just kind of, be, you just kind of have that normal relationship. So how is school? What you do today? What you study? Why do you smell? Did you go outside and you, you know, in gym or something? What happened to you? And you see like their pants are there. Oh, did you go outside? Did you? you know, you're just kind of aware of how their day went. If you don't have this, and you find your children always secluded from you, then be very careful because there is a good chance that your child is unloading all of those feelings with someone else. If your child is not speaking to you about their problems, they're probably speaking to somebody else about their problems. And that somebody else will say to them, who cares what your mom says? Who cares what your dad says? Who cares what you know religion you follow? Take off that thing on your head. You look like my old grandma, you know, and they just make them feel horrible about themselves. 
And that's when children start doubting. They start, they start answer, asking these really weird questions. I get them all the time. Sometimes it's mind-boggling to know why kids would ask these certain questions about Islam, about the Prophet, about the Quran, this and that. You know, one day an atheist would walk in front of a brother at school and you know, say to him, why are you praying in Arabic? You don't know the language, so why pray? And all of a sudden the brother is stumped. He pauses there and he's like, you're probably right, so why am I praying in Arabic? And start to fall into these problems. Make sure, parents, that you have a level of understanding and communication with your children. Now by this, I don't mean that all you have to do is restrict yourself to asking and talking to your children every day. That's part of it. A second way to do this, Mothers and fathers, if you don't have a Facebook right now, when this conference is over, go home and open up an account and poke your child. <laughs> the kids, they don't want to talk. Parts are just like, poke, stuck in it. When you get on Facebook, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And start to connect, start to speak the language of your children. Even me, as a, as a daddy, I always have to learn these languages all the time. I never would have been on Facebook unless it was to communicate with the youth, to communicate with people who only speak Facebook. I would never be on Twitter unless this was the only way to, to, to communicate to the Twitter crowd. I would never be on another social network unless it was for this reason. And because of this, Alhamdulillah, Allah closed the gap between me and them. A lot of people think I have these secrets of how I get through the youth. And they always say, you know, you so good with the youth, you know, come please talk at our event. I don't have any secrets. This is, this is all I do. As a matter of fact, I'm the farthest from a youth, even age-wise. I used to be in high school like 400 years ago, right? I'm far away from it. But it's just because as a daddy, every single moment I have, I want to make sure that I'm there, beside the youth and understand what they're dealing with. Ask yourself, have you ever gone into the university and colleges here? Has anybody ever gone into a high school here in this, in this society and see what children deal with every single day? See the pressures that are in front of them every single day? Don't be surprised if you do do that. And you got, you see your daughter, you see your son, but then all of a sudden you see that sister or that girl or that brother with no hijab that's wearing the miniskirt, but she's the same one that comes in niqab and abaya at the masjid in your community. Don't be surprised. Those are the harsh realities that are out there. Create a great environment for your children and Allah will protect your children in the environment outside of your home. So these are the words that we leave you with. Mothers and fathers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. And may Allah azza wa jal reward you for all of your sweat and tears that you gave for us children. We're not here without you. We can't survive without you. We can't understand the way the world works without your guidance. So may Allah Azza wa Jal reward you mothers and fathers and wallahi from my heart may Allah give you mothers and fathers Jannah, paradise for everything that you do for us the children. And children, may Allah Azza wa Jal protect all of you in this world in the pressures that you deal with each and every day. You're so innocent. You're so innocent, you come into this world and you're just gaga -ga -ga, you, know, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're saying, you don't understand how things work. And sometimes you get lured into the wrong direction because of your innocence. Allah, may Allah Azza wa Jal protect you in this environment in our times and reward you with paradise for yourself in the Akhirah. These are the words that I conclude with. I thank you all for your patience and for your time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.